OK, let's go back and review a little bit of what we talked about last week. Locke and Mill are the two people we talked about in the last two weeks. They had many similarities. They had many differences. Among the similarities is that they're both classical liberals. I wanted to jot down a few things to remember in connection with uh, the whole idea of classical liberalism, things that I don't think I emphasized in quite this concise way. But uh, Locke and Mill, at least the early Mill, okay, he changed his views, as any you know, alive and dynamic thinker may very well do as he thinks further about it, as he gets more experience. He changed his views the course, the course of his lives. Uh, I think from better to worse, but it's a matter of opinion. Both are classical liberals. Uh, and for our purposes, this is a uh, Maybe a little exaggeration, especially in the case of Mill. But uh, this, I want, wanted you to uh, equate with the idea of the night watchman state, a minimal state. Government should do not very much. The government should do what's necessary, in Locke's case, to pervert, preserve basic human rights that are identifiable by reason, just by contemplating human nature and, and the and realities of, of life in society and life in the world that we've got. Uh, for Mill, uh, it's not just contemplating those things from the philosopher's ivory tower. You have to figure out what institutional arrangements would finally lead to the greatest good to the, for the greatest number. And with lots of other uh, so-called classical liberals, Mill, especially early in his career, thought that the, what would do that is a really minimal state that freed people. So individual liberty. is a vital theme for the classical liberals. Again, depending on whether you're one of these natural rights, rights theorists like Locke or whether you're a consequentialist like Mill, your reasons for adopting uh, the idea that individual liberty is of a tremendous importance might be different. Uh, Locke thought that it was just sort of one of these fundamental, basic uh, facts that you could uh, figure out through the use of reason that, is that, the, that individuals ought to be free uh, because of their character, because that's what will allow humanity to flourish most uh, for Mill. I think it's the consequentialist in me. Every time I start trying to report on what Locke says, I start creeping over to something that sounds like a consequentialist. But he wasn't nearly so much a consequentialist. He was a rights theorist. Whereas for Mill, it's this regime of individual liberty that will eventually lead to the greatest prosperity for society and the greatest good for the greatest number. It's not that everyone will be equal in what they get uh, from their exercise of individual liberty. I think almost everybody who acknowledges, uh, every, everyone who is a, a classical liberal and, and uh, insists upon the importance of individual liberty, I think all of those folks will acknowledge that uh, different people will have different opportunities. Different people will succeed in using their freedoms in different ways. And so that means different people will get different outcomes. There will be differences in particular in wealth. Some people will be made wealthier than others in this regime of individual liberty. Uh, the idea, though, is when push comes to shove, is that according to those who are consequentialists anyway, the, 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 a society in which individual liberties are promoted will indeed yield disparities in wealth. But all things considered, everyone will be better off in that world than in a world which does not encourage individual liberty. In, uh, the short slogan is that uh, uh, in a classical liberal society, the rich get richer and the poor get richer. Everyone benefits. That's at least the claim. All right. um, along with economic liberty or individual liberty comes economic laissez faire. The idea of the economy should be left alone. There shouldn't be any government intervention in the economy. Uh, people should be able to buy and sell what they produce, buy and sell their labor uh, at will, with possible restrictions on slave contract contracts, but that's about all. 
And you can't, uh, you know, some, some, some classical liberals actually would say, well, if you want to sell yourself into slavery, that's a reasonable contract. It's hard to sometimes conceptualize that. But others would say, no, that's the one thing you can't alienate is your own freedom. So economic laissez-faire and fundamentally private property. Everybody in the world just about agrees that people should be allowed to own things like guitars and their clothing and you know, personal property like that. But what, we're, what there's an argument about between the liberal tradition and now the, uh, the, the socialist tradition that we're going to get into is whether there should be uh, private property over the means of production. And the first argument has to do with whether there should be private property in land. Land is one of those things required for the production of agricultural stuff. But uh, should there be private ownership of factories? Should there be private ownership of any of the, the things that, uh, of, of, the, of the major inst in, in installations in the world that, or the ma major factors in the world that yield, uh, that yield produce? Should individuals be allowed to, to own those things, control them in the way that they want, or should it be the, under the control of society as a whole? That's the argument. The classical liberal tradition that I've identified with Locke and Mill stands for all of these things. <coughs> okay. Uh, also, not just the classical liberals, but probably uh, most political traditions prior to the 19th century at least implied, if they didn't say explicitly, that, this, that all of these ideals, whether it's these ideals or others, but this is just a general idea they all seem to, to believe in, ideals can and do uh, play a vital role in shaping the development of society. That's a, a, a primary reason for, for doing this sort of work, this philosophy, sort of figure out what are the right ideals for society that we should adopt them and then we'll have a good society. If we can figure out uh, what the natural rights are through exercise of our re reason, then that will uh, shape the way we can build our society and, uh, and we have power. We can be sort of social engineers in this way. Uh, through the discussion of political ideals, political and social ideals. Whether these ideals be liberal or not. It's just the general agreement that ideals shape the world. Uh, now that, this thought is also shared by a group that I'm going to call with Marx the utopian socialists. Marx was certainly not the first socialist. Let's characterize socialists as people who, on the one hand, are largely critical of this liberal tradition. At least they see themselves, usually, as being critical of this liberal tradition. Insofar as, now, they share in it in a way, and that's what's a funny thing about socialism. It's both, it both seems, in, in one sense, to be uh, an offspring of liberalism, of the liberal tradition in one way, but also it, 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 it takes as one of its most uh, important tasks the refutation of liberalism. Liberalism is uh, a great enemy of the socialist tradition. This is almost like, I mean, you might, you know, might think of this as a parent-child sort of relationship where the child actually does 
get is is formed to a great extent by the parent, and yet thinks that one of the first tasks it has to do is kind of rebel and get out on its own and uh, and, and sort of set the, the child needs to set itself apart from the parent. And the way if you that's kind of metaphorical, but perhaps that's the way to understand socialism. Uh, socialism. Uh, I'll say utopian socialism. Now, I can put that in quotes, because it'll be the reason for calling it utopian socialism may not be the things that you think. It's not so much that the utopian socialists imagined, although some of them did, some of them didn't, uh, that there's some uh, utopia that we're to strive for. Uh, all people shaped by ideals, all people who think that the political life is shaped and formed by various ideals, uh, they all share some element of utopianism in that sense. The reason for calling these the following utopian socialists, um, the reason for calling them utopian is Marx's reason, and that's that these folks are not really uh, looking at things in terms of how the world is at all. All they're doing is sort of seeing that it doesn't measure up to some ideal and they're being critical. They're not really analyzing why the world is that way. Okay, but the utopian socialists uh, thought of themselves as uh, uh, for the people. Let's put it that way. In the sense that they were for the people, they were democratic. They were interested in promoting the welfare of the people. Um, they were not, there's some, a great many individual liberties were important to them, but uh, they certainly did, they were against laissez-faire, at least what they took to be laissez-faire, insofar as they thought that laissez-faire economics uh, promoted um, promoted the, the, the good of the rich and left the poor in the lurch. So according to the socialist critique, capitalism doesn't make everybody better off. Capitalism, the market, laissez-faire, makes the rich rich and the poor poor, puts the poor in control of the rich. And uh, importantly, they, were, they tended to be <coughs> against the idea of private ownership of the means of production. These should come under social control. Natural resources, first and foremost. Natural resources, uh, the idea would be no, no, no one deserves natural resources. They're here. Uh, the idea that uh, motivates these people, uh, much like the idea that got Locke started in his philosophy, the idea is that the stuff is uh, kind of the common heritage of all mankind. Whatever stuff's out there, whatever land, whatever minerals, whatever resources may be out there, they're the common heritage of all mankind. No one deserves more of these than anybody else. Now, some people indeed go out and, and get this stuff. They have in common a great respect for labor. This is again a way in which they inherit a good deal from Locke. Uh, for Locke, the whole justification for private property is an individual mixing his or her labor with resources that makes those things private property. The socialist critique would go like this. Uh, well, to, if you mix your labor with the, the land, say, and or you plant crops, Locke's argument is right so far as it goes. You're entitled to the product of that, of that labor. You're entitled to protection, even, from society as long as that crop is, is growing. But you don't get to own the land forevermore just because you've mixed your labor with it and grown one crop. I mean, if you continue to use the land for the growth of the stuff that, that you need or want, especially for stuff that's socially useful, then it, it continues to be legitimate to say that other people can't come in there and take the crop. They can't come in there and take what you've, what you've worked up. That is legitimate. But let's say you, you grow a couple of crops for a couple of years, and you decide, I don't want to do this anymore. And you go off to Florida. 
you can't still control that resource. If somebody else wants to come up and mix their labor with the land, then it should be them whose rights are protected. What in the world gives you the right, just because you've mixed your labor with a resource somewhere along the line? This is the, way, this is the, 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 the critique of a man named Pierre-Joseph Proudhon. Uh, French socialist who had uh, built a reputation for himself prior to Marx's coming along, but they were near contemporaries. But uh, Proudhon said, that, you know, what on earth gives anybody the idea that just because somebody mixes their, their labor with something, then it's theirs forever after? I mean, it, it, it makes sense to say that, you know, in order to encourage this kind of thing, we should say, as long as you're working on a project of that kind, as long as you're you know, working on, on producing crops, well, then you should be protected. You should have your rights protected against other interlopers, people who come in and want to either take the product of your labor or uh, use some of the land that you need for your project. You should be protected in this. That makes sense. But when you give up that project, that supposed that, that, that use, uh, socially useful project, society has no reason in the world to continue to protect your rights to the land. It's arbitrary that you happen to be in there first. And as long as you're doing productive stuff with it, that, it makes sense that we would, that society would have an interest in protecting your continuing use of that land. But you walk away from it, or if you say you want to use it for some purpose that's not socially useful, like you want to blow it up, uh, or just destroy it, some resource, that's, you know, you don't get any right like that. There's no, there's no logic to that, says Proudhon. There's no logic to saying that people get to do, to have the full ownership rights, the things that we associate with ownership, just because one time they mixed their labor with it. Now, there's a great line in a contemporary, actually a contemporary Lockean author named Robert Nozick, who is fond of lots of the stuff that, that, uh, that you can get out of Locke's theory. But nevertheless, he's a little bit concerned about this labor mixing principle as well. I mean, he, 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 he mentioned before that according to Locke, if you mix your, mix your labor, because it's something that's surely yours, I and mean, your labor is yours. If you mix that with something that nobody has any claim over, well, then you get a mixed product, and that makes this other thing, that makes it yours, too. And Nozick thought about that and said, well, that's kind of weird. I mean, it's, the idea seems to be that if I, if I own something and I mix it with something else that's not owned, maybe I want, well, then, then the mixed thing becomes mine. And he wondered, why, why is that a good way of making that other thing yours rather than a, just a good way of losing your labor? Losing the thing that was yours. I mean, for example, he said, let's say I'm sitting on the, you know, like I'm sitting on a cruise ship with a glass of tomato juice watching the sunset over a gorgeous, uh, a, go a gorgeous sea. And I decide, familiar with the laws of physics as I am, I decide I would love to own this ocean. I would love to make it mine. And here I have a glass of tomato juice. I'll just pour, now I own this, I bought this down at the bar. If I just pour this glass of tomato juice into the sea, I know, since I'm familiar with the laws of physics, that slowly but surely the tomato juice will dissipate throughout at least a large part of the ocean. Nozick argues, now who would, in the world would really think that that's a good way of coming to own the ocean instead of just a good way of losing your tomato juice? But that's the, it seems to be the structure of, no, of Locke's argument, that if I take something I own, my labor, I mix that with something that's unowned, well, it becomes mine. Why? Why isn't it just a loss of your labor? It would require at least a few more lines of explanation for us to see why, in the one case, you gain something, in the other case, you lose something, if there's a difference. But that's, that's, all, that's more or less the way that Proudhon looked at it, too and the utopian socialists. This whole institution of private property is a scam, they thought. It's a scam perpetrated on society by people who are, uh, who are in possession of private property, who are seeking for justifications of their private property. And they've come up with this. But what they're asking of society is that everyone else respect the same, um, respect that argument. And it would require a little bit more explanation if society is going to buy it. 
uh, there was a non, not specifically socialist, but there's also a German romantic tradition, which at least in his earlier years, Marx also kind of was influenced by. This is a tradition that may be somewhat familiar to you if you think back about what the 60s seemed to have represented. I'm not sure uh, how widespread these views are now, but it was pretty much an anti-industrialist, anti-technological uh, tradition. German romanticism suggested that, that uh, uh, our humanity is being robbed from us by the Industrial Revolution. We are losing touch with one another, with our worlds, and with ourselves, because we are more and more being forced to serve as cogs in a big industrial machine. Now, that's, not a, that's, that's not a socialist critique in particular. But, uh, but the 19th century was filled with uh, a romantic tradition that kind of got echoed. Um, it has been echoed many times, but one of the more recent times when it was echoed was during a lot of the sort of counterculture stuff in the 1960s. When those same critiques, and some of those same authors were resurrected uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a similar critique of modern post-industrialized society, modern uh, mechanized uh, quest for the mighty dollar, loss of humanity. Alienation is the watchword. And in one of the readings that you got for this week, or that you read last week, the first one, the more difficult one as it happens, it seems to me, and the less famous one, what you have is uh, uh, some of the early marks where you see some of that coming out. He talks about alienation. He tries to make a kind of a, a somewhat more hard-nosed economic case about what happens to workers in capitalist society. But you can see that a main theme has to be that we're losing our humanity. We're losing something important. We've lost it. And that's uh, what the part, at least what the early Marx got out of this German romantic tradition. Now, whatever, however much Marx may have been influenced in his earlier years by the socialists who went before him, and however much he may have been influenced by this German romantic tradition, he renounced all that. In fact, the first reading that you've got comes from a collection of readings uh, that Marx refused to publish during his lifetime, and even Engels. Uh, who was Marx's literary executor, Engels refused to publish them because both Marx and Engels regarded this early work as being from his sort of young, foolish, romantic self. Uh, but it, it does, the, it, it's in the readings because it does give you a flavor of some of the things that influenced him. As, uh, as the editor of the collection points out, and this is one of those, this is one of the essays I think is better by the editor of, of the collection, by the Ebensteins. Uh, by the way, but as they point out, um, uh, the essay about alienation is one of the things that made Marx seem more sympathetic to the West, especially in periods like the 60s, when there's uh, all kinds of dissatisfaction with, uh, with uh, having people, individuals having to fit themselves into the niche, niches provided by society, into the big cog, the big wheels of society. Uh, whenever there's resentment like that, it's that Marx that comes, you know, that gets put forward as, uh, as a sympathetic. Marx himself renounced that stuff. He thought that was all gushy, sticky, uh, uh, unhelpful, foolish romanticizing. And uh, while he wrote some of the stuff, I think at the age of 26, within about five years of that, He's still quite young, but within five years of that, he'd renounced that whole approach to the analysis of politics and society in favor of something more scientific. So that's what, what Marx wanted to oppose to utopianism. was social science. Scientific socialism, put that in brackets. <clears throat> 
I think maybe in the very, very first lecture of the quarter, I'm not sure if I even did it then, but I, I, I'm trying to think back. I believe in the very first lecture of the quarter, I mentioned that in the 19th century, there was this big movement uh, headed up by a fellow named August Comte, among others, in France, called positivism. But the, the whole idea of this, I mean, by the, by the, by the middle of the last century, the, the natural sciences, especially physics, had become so successful in explaining their realms of inquiry. I mean, physics was moving forward by leaps and bounds and had seemingly had, had left philosophy, in other words, you know, sort of batting about you know, questions that don't seem to have very clear-cut answers. It had left that far behind. It had left that behind 200 years before. It was moving forward, making progress, learning things, probing its area of inquiry to ever greater depths and learning things in ever more uh, broad ranges. Um, and in the, in the 19th century, for whatever reason, um, quite the opposite of this romantic movement, in a way. The German romanticism suggested too much technology, too much analysis. What we need is more poetry, more flowers, more life, more, um, we should all put flowers in our hair and go to San Francisco. That's what they said. No, I guess that was later. But um, uh, quite a, a, a contrary tradition. This positivist tradition suggested that what we need to do is to put aside all the silly philosophizing, all the metaphysics, all this you know, uh, theoretical speculation. Put that away, and let's get more hard-nosed in our analysis of science. What we need is a science of society. And I think what I mentioned early in that early lecture was that August Comte is the founder of sociology of the science. Gave it its name, and indirectly of, uh, of of political science, insofar as that's to be distinguished from political theory or political philosophy. Okay. So there's the big movement. The big movement in the 19th century was uh, that this this big movement was a movement toward uh, toward. Uh, analysis, toward empirical evidence, toward trying to describe what happens rather than dwell on what ought or should or what it would be really nice if we had. So we're going to analyze society by looking at how does it actually work rather than how we would like it to work. We're going to try and understand it as opposed to preaching to it. I mean, the whole thing about utopian socialist, if you had to have pick one word that would capture what Marx thought was so dumb about it, was it was preachy. It sounded like what you'd get you know, out of a pulpit, not what you would get from an analyst, someone who's trying to do something productive. Uh, Marx, while one of the most influential political philosophers ever, would have hated being called a philosopher. It's the last thing he wanted to be thought of, because his understanding of philosophy was just the same way. He thought it was this preachy stuff, this speculative stuff, the stuff that really didn't you know, do its homework, much like the image of philosophy, I think, in the late 20th century. It's, I think it's an incorrect image, but uh, th there can be no doubt but that lots of people who do what they call philosophy are not really listening to what you know, the world tells them. They're, they're isolated in their ivory tower. They're isolated up there, and they're um, not listening to the world. Uh, a notable, I mean, even, even one of the, the great speculative philosophers of all time, Hegel, in the 19th century, the German philosopher Hegel, uh, who certainly couldn't be accused of being an empirical scientist, more than a philosopher. Nonetheless, he is famous for one of the great remarks that's repeated by the people who are antagonistic to philosophy in this regard. Uh, he said, uh, the owl of Minerva, 
the owl of Minerva flies only at dusk. Now that doesn't tell you anything until I explain it. The owl of Minerva is supposed to represent philosophy and does traditionally in literature. The owl of Minerva, Minerva flies only at dusk. Only after all the work is done, only after the real changes have been made, only after anything that's going to really happen has happened, then along come the philosophers and they analyze it. They don't bake any bread. They don't do anything, the philosophers. In other words, ideals don't shape. Where's that other piece of paper? The thing that was shared, the idea that was shared, I won't put this paper down. Uh, yeah, I will. The idea that was shared both by the classical liberals, apparently, and by the utopian socialists, this idea that political and social ideals can and do play a vital role in shaping the development of society, that's specifically what Hegel says is just wrong. The owl of Minerva flies only at dusk. Philosophers, when they get around to writing about stuff, they're just describing what's already happened. Example would be, if you get somebody like Locke talking about natural rights theory and private property rights and stuff, it sounds for all the world as if he is proposing what should happen and that then, once everybody reads and considers Locke's wisdom very, very carefully, they say, yes, that's a good idea. Let's install this system of rights. Hegel says, that's not the way it happens. The system gets installed for whatever reasons there are out there in the world. Then somebody like Locke comes along and tells you what the system is. He didn't produce the system of private property rights. It came to be for quite different reasons. Reasons quite independently of the thoughts of philosophers. And in Marx's Similar remark, he says, the philosophers have only interpreted, oops, the world, the point is to change it. practical man, or at least that's the way he thought of himself. The whole idea that I want you to get out of this is that Marx finds the philosophical tradition impractical, ineffective, merely reflective of the status quo at any particular time. They tell you what they see all right that they're not, they don't change it, they don't do anything. Ideals for Marx, all these ideologies, whether they're utopian socialist, whether they're liberal, whether they're something else, they flow out of circumstances that are produced independently. They don't create the circumstances. And I want you to think about this. This is Karl Marx who you might think of as someone who argues for um, the importance of ideas in changing the world. But Karl Marx didn't produce the Russian Revolution. That was Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, or Ulyanov, his original name. And Lenin was no Marxist on this score. In fact, he, de he deliberately, explicitly renounced the whole Marxian line of thought on this matter. For Lenin, who came along later, the world won't change unless there is a small cadre of revolutionaries who are, to some extent, philosophers, but they're certainly ideologues, a small cadre, in particular, in Lenin's case, of communist revolutionaries who will structure, guide, create, make, and preserve social change? Without them, without the cadre of, of the intellectual elite 
the vanguard. And that's going to be the Communist Party. Without that vanguard, there uh, won't be any social change. That, there couldn't be a doctrine different from, more different from Marx's own. For Marx, things don't happen unless the conditions are right for them to happen, and then they happen. Doesn't matter whether somebody gets a good idea. Here's the way things should be. Things in the social world happen only when the conditions are right for them to happen. And the conditions that are most important are economic conditions. All right. So the whole uh, thought here, uh, whether we're talking about Comte or Marx, uh, is that society should be studied as any other scientific object. We're trying to figure out how it works. In particular, we're trying to figure out what is it that has caused its evolution? What are the evolutionary processes and forces that are, that are, going, that are ongoing as society changes over the years? And this is something that uh, Marx believed could be identified. You could actually see that there were certain uh, uh, themes that repeated themselves historically. You could see it in the change from feudalism to capitalism. You could see it in the change from capitalism to socialism. You could see it earlier. You could see it later. And what I'll, what I'll do uh, is give you at least a couple of examples of that as we go on. But study society. Study, study social development in particular, just like you would any other natural process. Avoid preachiness. Avoid trying to bring ideology to the subject. It should be objective in that sense, that you're not bringing your ideals to the study of society. And with that end in view, he buried himself in the British Museum, studying records uh, year in and year out, studying records uh, about the, of the development of, uh, of, of capitalism in Britain um, while he wrote his great work, Das Kapital. He was trying as hard as he could to be objective. The particular, uh, quote, scientific, unquote, approach that Marx takes is often called dialectical materialism, but because I don't want to get into the dialectical part of it, I'll ask you to think of it as historical materialism. It's supposed to be, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a way of understanding uh, the development, the, dyna the, the, dy the dynamic uh, historical de development of society. It's, it, it's trying to figure out how come societies change in the particular ways they do. It's trying to figure out the dynamics of that. So in other words, it, it takes as its first problem the question, uh, what are the forces that yield social change? So that's why it's historical. It's going to look back in history. That's, a lot of its data is going to be historical. It's going to look back in history, look at previous changes. It's going to try and figure out what caused those changes. Uh, and then these principles that it learns from history presumably can be applied in the present and future. Trying to draw generalizations about how society moves uh, from historical <coughs> data. That's why it's historical. It's materialist. I mean, the reason it's called a, a, a materialistic theory. Now, let me do it this way. Let me ask you, what, what, what connotations does the word materialism have? Because I think in some ways this might be close to what you have in mind. In other, way, in other ways, the, this use of the term might be different. What's materialism? What do you think of if somebody says something's materialistic? If Madonna says she's a material girl. Um, any other applications? There's a lot of different ones, so don't try and just pick out one, but yeah. Goods you own. I'm sorry? Goods you own. Good stuff. <coughs> it has to do with stuff that you own. Property. Wealth, maybe. Uh, that's not what Marx has in mind, but there's going to be something in common there. And there's some sort of common theme through all these different uses of materialism. Any other? Suggestions about uses of the word materialism. 
something that's physical rather than like mental, something that you actually touch. And move. Right, tangible rather than uh, kind of tan. Yeah, but not mental. How about that? Okay. Any others that you think of? Um, yeah. Show of love. Ah, okay. So once again, back back to the same, you know, like like especially trying to think of you know, the Madonna case, <laughs> as it's you know showy, uh, uh, ostentatious display of wealth. Yuppies. Yeah, yuppies, right? Uh, what perhaps we'd all like to be able to do <laughs> if we could, but uh, then but we never can. We cast aspersions on it. Um, uh, well, the main force here of materialism, I mean, materialism also is the name of a doctrine about the soul, incidentally, if anybody cares. But I mean, sometimes people think that uh, human beings are to be understood as um, not simply the matter energy that makes them up. They've got something else. They've got a psyche, a soul, a mind, something that is uh, different from the matter energy. It's as, I mean, on that particular uh, his, uh, traditional view, probably still the most widely held view about what a person is in the world, on that traditional view, um, which might be called mentalism or idealism, uh, a person kind of is like a driver in the vehicle. I mean, like we're in the driver's seat and we're kind of steering the, the, the body. The body's one thing, the mind, the soul's another. And of course, on that kind of understanding of human beings, that at least allows for the possibility. It's not necessary, not a necessary consequence of, of mentalism, but it allows for the possibility that maybe there would be an afterlife. You know, once the, the shell of the body falls away, um, there's still the soul that remains somehow, somewhere, in some way, and uh, it goes on. Uh, as opposed to that view about what a person is, is materialism which says, no, all we are is uh, just, we're, we're a complicated machine, really, really complex one, but all we really are is the stuff that makes us up or some kind of complex pattern, but there's nothing non-material about us, no soul, nothing that transcends matter energy. That doctrine is called materialism, so that's another one. Uh, what materialisms usually have in common is that they're imagined by their proponents anyway to be kind of down to earth. They're down to earth. There's something about the idea of the tangible that's important here. But uh, basically the real, the real key is that they're not idealistic. Okay? They're not, uh, they don't uh, make reference to any kind of non-material ideas or mode of being that transcends the, com the commonsensical down to earth stuff that's all around us. Historical materialism is basically named that because of the opposition we talked about already uh, of Marx to idealism. He was an anti-utopia in some important sense. He didn't think that uh, a good reason to be a so socialist is because it was nice and just and fair. I mean, those are kind of squishy reasons. Those are preachy reasons. And he didn't think that those were the reasons to be a socialist, at least, and especially in his later career, which is his main career. Uh, he thought that just through an analysis of historical process, an analysis of society, in other words, down-to-earth stuff, the real world, the way society really works, uh, that's the basis for socialism. An examination of you know, not any ideals, but an examination of the way things actually work. Scientific examination. And in particular, what uh, he argues is that society can be understood and its evolution can be understood in terms of an evolution in the material conditions of production. In economic terms. 
terms of the material conditions of production. Um, <coughs> what's that involved? Well, there, at any given time in the history of a society, it's going to have to be, it's going to be producing things. That's what we're talking about here. It's going to be uh, producing products. People are going to be at work. It's the, the, the thing about human life is that, uh, according to Marx, is that it's characterized by work, uh, an attempt to, to uh, make use of natural resources for the purposes, for the necessary purposes of survival and whatever else is possible beyond survival. So there will always be certain, at any, at any particular stage of society, there will be certain resources that are available. And that will be part, you know, wh whatever resources happen to be available at a particular point in time in a particular society uh, to, to use for production, uh, that will be part of the specification of the material conditions of production. Uh, some, you know, at some point uh, in the history of humanity, um, people gained access to oil, for example. That was a great revolution in the history of the development of the material conditions of production. Before that time, the material conditions of production were different. Didn't have that stuff. Uh, another. Uh, this covers a world of issues, a stage of the development of technology. Um, labor techniques. Uh, methods. financing projects. The, the, the knowledge base. What people understood. So in a way you could pack in the stage and the development of science. All of this stuff, I put dots down there to indicate that this isn't supposed to be an exhaustive list. The things that I've mentioned are just supposed to be examples of part of what goes into understanding the, what, what Marx meant by the material conditions of production. Now, he thought that the evolution of all these things, there's, there's, there's uh, times when uh, maybe there's some backward movement, sometimes when uh, ideas are lost, technologies are lost, resources are depleted. Uh, so there are moments in history, perhaps, when things are moving backwards. But for the most part, through most of the history of humanity, uh, there's a, a slow, steady progress. So the development has a direction. The evolution is a progressive, I'll put that in parenthesis, a progressive change. Things are getting better and better and better, maybe painfully slowly sometimes, but that's the direction of change. It's an improvement not just you know, sometimes good, sometimes bad. Is that clear? I mean, it says these things, these are the material conditions of production. Um, let me put another important one down. I'll put uh, uh, The legal system with its rights, obligations, the, the system of government, which might be, doesn't include more than just the laws. Uh, the relation between management. Labor. 
more dots. All these things are part of material conditions of production. It's the ways things are done and all of that that entails. It's an evolution in this whole system, this whole web of things. That's what causes historical change. It's not ideas. <coughs> it's not liberal ideas or communist ideas or any other kind of ideas that, that create social change. People can have ideas all the time. There have been communist ideas as far back as Plato. Remember, Plato talked about communism for, his, uh, for the Guardian class, or at least something that looked like it was communalist, if not communist. But he looked, you know, a system in which uh, there would be uh, no private ownership of much of anything. And uh, I think it's probably unfair to call that communist. It really doesn't have much relationship to what Marx was proposing. But still, these ideas have been in the air forever. Just like there have been ideas. I mean, there's a comparable thesis. It's, it's, it, this is an interesting comparison. There have been ideas about the structure of the physical world that have been around forever. The, the atomic theory of matter, for example, was, was uh, enunciated at least as early, maybe longer, ago than this even, but at least as early as Democritus and Leucippus. They were pre-Socratic philosophers. They wrote, in other words, before the time of Socrates, before the time of Plato. The atomic theory of matter was enunciated, you know, 2,500 years ago. But it was enunciated as a philosophical theory. It wasn't until science was able to develop slowly, carefully, that there were good reasons to adopt it universally toward the end of the last century. I mean, it, it, it had developed. It was a popular theory even before the, the, the end of the last century. But at the end of the last century, uh, lots of developments in science, both in physics and in chemistry, came together to, make, uh, to, to give an overwhelming support to the, to, the, uh, to the atomic theory of matter. And the, and the kind of Marxian thesis about that, the, the Marxian observation about that is that you know, people can think up these theories and these ideas you know, all day long in all kinds of different places, but they're not really going to be warranted for widespread uh, uh, um, acceptance until we get into the position where we can see their truth. I mean, they're philosophical ideas before that. But once we have uh, lots of other developments in hand, then we're in a position to accept the theory. Well, in, in politics, in the development of society, in the development of government, in the development of legal systems, any of these things, um, real change won't happen until the, con the material conditions are right. Um, until, you're, till, until society's in a position to implement certain technological ideas, <coughs> by virtue of the availability of materials, by virtue of a need for the particular technology, until that time, you know, <coughs> a technological innovation is just another lame brain idea. And so, so it's true with all of this stuff. They, they, they develop uh, hand in glove. They develop slowly <laughs> and together. And big scale social change, like changes from a monarchic system to a or for better, from a feudal system to a capitalist system. And then changes like the one from capitalism to, to Marxism or to socialism, these changes can't happen unless the material conditions of production are right. And that's what will drive them. It's not ideas. It's not somebody's ideas. Even if nobody had the ideas, the changes would happen. They would, get, they would, they would happen because they would be called for by the needs of society as it continues to evolve its material conditions of production. Um, I'll probably return to that thing in a moment. Uh, one way of picking out some broad categories among the material conditions of production um, is to distinguish between the forces of production <coughs> 
this includes all that, maybe the stuff on the top of the list, sort of read the resources available, technology, labor techniques, methods of, I don't know about methods of financing. It's hard sometimes to get things sorted out exactly between these two broad character categories, but the forces of production versus the relations of production And by the relations of production are things that you might, I mean, I'll just try to characterize them in general and then point back at some examples. These are sort of like the institutional framework. Of society. To include stuff like the legal system, whether it's a democratic or a non-democratic government, a managerial system, all of those things fit into the category of relations of production. In particular, a really important one is the property system. Communal, private, some mix. And different societies will need, will require different uh, relations of production, different social frameworks as they, as the material, or the more material forces of production as they change. Now what's always driving this whole system is the human need to produce. Uh, not just for survival, but to, to produce. And, and uh, you have an example in the first reading of a kind of a romantic young Marx uh, talking about labor, talking about the, um, the alienation of labor under capitalism. But what you get a picture of there is not just this critique of capital, but you get a kind of a vision of when he was more young and more romantic before he had just sort of really you know, sort of put that behind them to go f full speed ahead for the, for the scientific approach to socialism. You have a kind of a clear picture of what he thinks was the, was the, the, the better alternative. I mean, in, under capitalism, he says, labor is alienated. I mean, people are working for a wage. They're not working for the, uh, just for the noble purpose of producing the product. They're, people are generally not working at jobs that they even necessarily particularly like. They are just filling a spot in a big, huge economic system. They're, you know, they're trying to make the best of it. You know, and, the, and the ones of us who are luckier get jobs that are somewhat to our liking. Uh, but, uh, but, but by and large, production in a capitalist economy, he claims, is one in which uh, human beings who are naturally understood as workers, producers, uh, they, are, they don't have any particular stake in the particular thing that they're producing. Uh, I guess the, the clearest example of, of this that keeps, you know, that, that's familiar to you is the idea of the, of the assembly line worker who's just, you know, putting screw A at the slot, you know, hole B all day long, not really doing anything that's craftsman-like, not really producing a product that the worker can care about. I mean, if, if the company's very lucky that there's enough, uh, there's, there may be, uh, for other reasons, there's enough uh, 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 positive spirit in the plant so people can sort of be proud of the ultimate product that the plant makes. But the worker, you know, is stuck in a position where it's really hard to be really proud of putting screw A into whole B. It's not something that really uh, calls much on the worker's creativity. And it's under capitalism, Marx says, and others did too. It's under capitalism where, where this is exacerbated to the, to the greatest extent. Uh, it's not just that the worker is alienated from the product, you know, distanced from the product. The worker is distanced from work itself and the things that work can do for a person, can be fulfilling, can be uh, a real essential part of a human life. But, you know, when, when the work is kind of not owned by you, when it's owned by your employer, um, this is an alienating experience. You're kind of torn, you're, you're, you're distanced even from yourself in a way. Now that's some of the themes that you have in uh, the, uh, the the work of the young Marx there. Um, when uh, when when 
capitalism comes along. It comes along because that's what um, increases production. That's it, it's in, a, in the Communist Manifesto, which you also read, the second example. There's a long um, section where he urges his readers to understand just what a great contribution capitalism has made in this historical sequence, in the historical development of the material conditions of production. He says, capitalism has conjured whole populations out of the ground. In other words, lots of people who would have never lived or died now can live. Now they live, they work, they contribute to the system. Um, he says, you know, they, 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 it's, it's capitalism that's responsible for seeing just exactly what uh, possibilities there are embedded in social labor, in human labor. In other words, capitalism shows us what we can do, what the, what the potential is. And it's enormous. And, and capitalism uh, is responsible for this. Now, what the, the basic idea is that throughout history, um, the forces of production go through a slow development. I mean, we learn new techniques from our experience with old. When, whenever we develop some new technique, whenever we uh, find some new resource, whenever some new invention comes along, uh, these things take their place in production, creating new conditions. New problems arise, new needs arise, and some more things are sought out, more resources are sought out, new inventions come along, new techniques are, uh, are designed to uh, take care of problems with the immediately preceding techniques. So there's all these evolutions in, in the forces of production. And uh, at some point, the relations of production, which are supposed to be a framework for, for, uh, for work, for social work, um, they no longer suit the needs of the forces of production. In other words, the forces of production develop to such a point where they outstrip the ability of the institutional framework, the relations of production, like the property laws, uh, to, to uh, continue the, the forward movement, the, the, uh, the arrangements, the social arrangements, no longer suit the needs of the forces of production. They are outgrown. And in every society, no matter where you are, there are people who are more or less in control of the society. That's the, the, there are, uh, there's a, 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 a governing, a ruling class, if you like. There'll be important insofar as there are ruling economic class, insofar, insofar as they're guiding, they're, they're responsible for guiding the, uh, the institutional framework. And uh, there will be other classes. Who are the guided? So just think about this. Perhaps you will agree with Marx that there has been a continuing technological progress, a continuing progress in the availability of resources, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Perhaps you'll also agree that in every society there's been some class or another, an economic class, whether it's the, the feudal lords or whether it's the, uh, the, uh, the capitalists or in socialist societies, whether it's uh, bureaucrats of some kind or another, that in every society there is a class of persons who are more or less at the vanguard of their society. They're the ones that are really doing the moving and the shaking. It's not going to be the government all the time. I think in our society it would have to be those people who are you know, most involved in changes that go on in industry, <coughs> in the capitalist world, and that the government isn't, you know, leading so much as trying to sort of accommodate different interests at best. Uh, the interests of the, of, the, of the people who are at the heads of these big industries, the interests of labor, the interests of citizens of all kinds. But uh, the, the people who are doing the moving and the shaking, the people who are really profiting from this stuff, or Bill Gates, folks like that. That would be the way this analysis would go. 
So in every, in every society, there's a class of persons who are um, not just the beneficiaries. I don't want to just sort of say, they are the movers and the shakers. They are the people who are doing, the, it's, it's, it's the class that dominates the economic world, whatever the state of the economy and whatever the state of the material means of production. And another way of talking about history is not just in terms of the evolution in the, in the material conditions of production, but if you want to look at this strictly socially, you can say that the history has been dominated always by class struggle. That um, a class that um, classes come into power, uh, history moves on a little bit, and those classes become challenged sometimes by new classes. But that there's always a, 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 a contention among classes for control over the material conditions of production, for control over society. And uh, Marx sets as his project the analysis of how that works, the class, the class conflict that, uh, that uh, has dominated history. Forces of production, kind of a natural evolution. No one really is in charge of that. I mean, people make personal contributions. There are inventors. There are managers who have good ideas, or they have ideas anyway, and they try to implement them. And I guess the good ones are the ones that survive. It's kind of an evolutionary model here. But uh, it, it's really sort of automatic. What happens, and it's automatic because when people think of, you know, when new, whatever, whatever the way of doing things is that you've got, you know, it creates certain kinds of problems. It has certain needs. And it's, it's a natural thing for, over time anyway, for people to figure out new ways of accomplishing those ends. And, 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 and again, just like in evolution, things seem to kind of get more and more efficient, depending on the conditions in which they're evolving. It's the conditions of, it's, it's the conditions of society that kind of drive the evolution. All right, so much for that. Any questions about this so far? This is what we, what we mean by historical materialism. We're trying to analyze the, the, the development of society in terms of economic stuff, basically. And there's also a bunch of legal stuff in there, like the laws about property, the whole, the whole institutional framework. That's not straightforwardly economic, but it's, it's there to try and facilitate production. That's what it's there for. I mean, that's what, the, that's what we're trying to do with any uh, set of, of, of laws governing property rights and the disposition of property. What laws about property are, are the rules for who shall and who may not dispose of resources and, and what may be done and what can't be done. I mean, that's what rules about property are. And of course, there's lots of other rules and laws, but they're really very, very important in terms of the development of material conditions of production. And sometimes the forces of production develop enough so that the old rules just are not adequate anymore. This is a really kind of silly example of the kind of thing Marx had in mind. And I don't want you to think of this as, a, as marking some great moment in, in, the, in the development of the historical conditions of production. But I thought of this the other day as something that at least makes some sense to me. Uh, we've had property rights uh, in all kinds of things, including intellectual property rights. And as long as all we had to worry about were books, physical books, right, then we could talk about those intellectual property rights almost as if it's the same as, you know, the property rights over land or property rights in houses or property rights over guitars or clothing or anything else. Because it seemed as if the ideas uh, that were being protected by intellectual copyright you know, sort of could be captured in a physical object like this. But the minute you started having things like um, even tape recorders, <coughs> where you could record, I mean, when, as long as all we had was records, then you had to buy the physical object to get the music. But the minute they developed tape recorders, then people could copy it. And you know that the people that produce records said, no, 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 you mustn't do that. You mustn't do that. But suddenly the technology had developed so that the the property right laws that's supposed to protect the rights of the musician, protect the rights of the, of, of the composers and all that stuff. Um, the conditions of the te technological conditions that are out, uh, had, 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 
had gone to such a point where the, the old laws really couldn't constrain activity. So people said, yeah, I know, I'm not supposed to copy this stuff. But people did. I mean, people do, right and left. Same thing with Xerox, photocopying. Not just Xerox, but photocopying in general. When it, when it evolved, I mean, there's all kinds of laws that's supposed to protect the writers of, 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 uh, of written materials, protect their interests. Property right laws. Uh, but photocopying is so simple, it's, and it's quite impossible to enforce uh, the, the, the rights. So in a way, those particular rights, the, you know, they, they don't, this way of understanding property rights has been surpassed by the technology. And of course, the big deal now is software. Intellectual rights in software. I mean, people, the same reasons why you, you sometimes think, well, we, we have to have private property. We have to give people property rights in the things that they produce, like their crops. That's what the question was with Locke. We have to keep, give people copyrights in those things, because otherwise they wouldn't be, they would have no incentive to producing stuff like that. If we don't give them property rights in the crops that they that they put the seed down for, well, then they wouldn't put the seed down in the first place. They say, why should I? If, I? if I put the seed down and somebody else gets to come along and take the corn, I mean, I just wasted my labor, haven't I? I'm not going to do that. So to give people incentive to do stuff like that, it's production, right? To give people incentive for doctor production, you give them rights. Well, how are you going to give people, you know, incentive to write software if, 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 if others are free to simply copy it? Shouldn't they get copyright in it? Well, yes, they do. But there's no way, apparently no way, really, to enforce copyright in such things. And so we're at a stage right now where, in a way, the technology, you know, which is one of the major forces, material forces of production, the technology has outstripped, momentarily anyway, our understanding of property rights. And uh, it may need to be revised. Now what Marx is pointing out is that sometimes the extent to which the material forces of production outstrip the relations of production, sometimes that's so great as to require a total collapse, a total revision of the institutional system. That's when you get social revolutions. I mean, there could be all kinds of little, this is like, you know, you also consider sort of like movements of, uh, of the continents, you know, the tectonic plates. I mean, they can, sometimes they can budge along and budge along and budge along and uh, make small corrections as they go. And there's no big earthquakes, but when something there's a big obstacle. There's a big obstacle. There's something really is stopping the, the, the plate from moving. It just, the, the tensions grow and they grow and they grow and they grow and they grow. And then finally, when they give out, they give out in an explosion. It's another analogy. You can then sort of understand how he, under, how he sees the movement of society and how it changes. The feudal system of property was one in which there was a, a close relationship between the, the lord and the peasants. It was a mutual system in which it wasn't just like they were slaves or something. The lord had an obligation to provide for the defense of the community. And the, pe the peasants did the work. They got a certain amount of, of, the, uh, of the product of the land, and they turned over another. It's like a, you think of it as a tax, if you like, but it was a property arrangement. It the land really belonged to the lord in, the, in this conception, and the peasants turned over uh, part of their produce every year to the to the to the lord, and the lord then that was then the lords to sell and buy, uh, pay salaries of soldiers and stuff like that to defend it, defend it, the territory. Uh, in that, this is an example of the kind of thing that Marx has in mind. In that system, uh, there was a need for other stuff too. We had basically, you know, peasants who were doing sort of uh, agricultural stuff by and large, and so you know, there's also things like the production of foodstuffs. There's more than just growing things that was involved. There was, there was making cheese and butter and all that stuff, but there was other things that were needed too. And as, as you know, there's sometimes there'd be somebody, you know, a village down the road. You know, would have something that wasn't produced in large enough quantity in our village. There grew a need for tradespeople who would move back and forth. There grew a need for small shop owners, business people who didn't produce the stuff themselves, but who uh, sold it, bought it, and sold it from third parties. All the same kind of division of labor stuff that we rehearsed long ago when we talked about Plato. But what Marx wants to focus attention on is a whole bunch of characters were needed by that society as time went by, 
who weren't specifically, you know, in the, they, they weren't the lords and they weren't the peasants, like small business people. Uh, financiers, people who actually, this, this is not just in that time, in the feudal period of time, but there's also a need for people who will finance projects, who will be money lenders. And uh, so there grew up a, a, a category of persons that you might think of as the middle class. They weren't peasants and they weren't lords. But as they grew, uh, their needs, you know, they, they lived in a kind of a world of their own. They were a different class. Their needs outstripped the ability of the feudal system to take care of them. Uh, the feudal system uh, had, you know, fairly rigid controls over the markets. It had uh, internal customs and duties and tariffs that sort of were in the way of the growth of capital and the growth of the middle class. There was constant monetary instability in the feudal era, which didn't serve the financial, uh, the, 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 the people who were trying to finance projects didn't serve them very well. So that the, the, uh, there, there, there eventually came a point when the feudal system needed, it just fell away, it collapsed in the face of the, of the growing importance of the bourgeoisie, the middle class, the class that was eventually to establish capitalism as the dominant system. But it was because of the needs of the society, the growing needs, and it was a fairly, fairly successful feudal system that made it possible for people to buy stuff other than just the bare means of survival or to, or, or, or to barter for it, and that produced a middle class, and then the middle class had its own logic it had needs that weren't suited by the feudal system, so the feudal system finally collapsed and uh, capitalism came to dominate, dominate. What Marx basically urges is that the same thing was happening in the 19th century to capitalism itself. Capitalism needs labor, needs to produce laborers, and needs labor cheap, it needs to, to assemble huge numbers of people in small numbers of places. It needs large factories, large firms. So it creates labor, tries to hold its wages down. And one way to hold the wages down is to produce more laborers. So there's lots of people competing for the same job. <coughs> and, and there will always be some pool of laborers who are unemployed, says Marx. I mean, this is a requirement of capitalism. There always have to be a pool of laborers who are presently unemployed so that the, so that the, so that the manager the capitalist can say to the laborers who are employed, he can say to them, well, you know, I'd love to raise your wages, but I can't, because my competitor would then be able to undersell me, and we'd all go out of business. So if you insist, if you insist that I raise your wages, I have to say no, but I do know that there's a whole bunch of people who are presently unemployed would be happy to take your job from you. It's also in the interest of capitalism, said Marx. It's in the interest of capitalism to make labor as mind, you know, as, as, as little dependent on the mind as possible, so that people are kind of interchangeable, so anybody could do the job. Then you can pay them little, you can interchange people, and that's what Marx said happened. Uh, uh, something called an industrial reserve army is created of unemployed people, chronically unemployed people, who sometimes can be brought in as threats to the employed, you know, so that the employed say, yeah, yeah, I better, I better not make too much noise or else the boss will hire these unemployed. <coughs> the Industrial Reserve Army grew, but capitalism was, according to Marx, sowing the seeds of its own destruction. It was doing this because it was bringing all these people together. And that what Marx thought was happening then and would continue to happen in, in greater and greater numbers is that the workers would wise up. The workers would, you know, they would get together. They were being brought together in the factories. It wasn't as if they were isolated and, and competing only. They were also being brought together in the factories and they were also getting together out there on the streets when they were unemployed, trying to stand in line looking for jobs. But they got together. And eventually they would realize that all production depended on them. There wasn't anything that the capitalists could do without them. Nothing. Everything depended on them. I mean, the capitalist wants to make anything, even make coats, limousines. You've got to have workers to do that. Capitalists don't know how to do that. And they'd wise up. There would be a growing self-consciousness of the working class. And they would see that uh, the system was not serving them, even though it was totally dependent upon them. Once that happened, the days of capitalism would be very short indeed as workers became conscious of their power. <laughs>
in the system. That's the inevitability. That's the idea of the inevitability of socialism. It's not that it's a good idea. It's not that it's a noble idea. It's that it's just going to happen. Now, it might not happen today, and it might happen a little bit differently from society to society, depending on what the conditions are, but it's going to happen. The workers just, won't, they'll wise up, and they won't put up with this. Especially Marx thought, if there were some people like me to point the thing out to them. But uh, he, didn't, he didn't think very much. I mean, it is, you know, the, the way I think he thought about this was that not much really depended on the, the philosopher, the analyst, the person, the, as, I, as he said, the quote before, the philosopher interprets stuff. And even, I, he wouldn't like to think of himself as a philosopher, but he is an interpreter. He's trying to explain how the whole system works. System works anyway. We don't need the explanation of how gravity works for it to work. It's a natural force. It works. And then maybe late in our, maybe no one ever would have figured out the, the, the laws of gravitation. That's a whole different enterprise, figuring out the laws of it, uh, gravitation. The laws of gravitation are there. And that's what he's saying about this process, too. He says, this process would go on even if there were no Marxists, even if there were no analysts, no philosophers to interpret it. The world works this way. These are the forces at work in the changes of society. There's an inevitability of the socialist revolution. Uh, it will grow out of the internal contradictions of capitalism. Capitalism creates the conditions for its own demise by its, its dependency upon the worker. And since the government always expresses the will of the dominant class, once the capitalist era is supplanted by the dictatorship of the proletariat, there will be a radical change in the relations of property, radical changes in, this, in the institutional framework, in other words, in the relations of production, that reflects the needs of the workers. And finally, since the workers are really the lowest, the last element, the last class in society to finally emerge as dominant, in Marx's view, this history of humanity, which is the history of class struggle, it will be ended. Class struggle will stop once the proletariat comes under control. Everyone will become a proletarian. Everyone will be a worker. There will be no differences in classes, so there will be no need for class struggle. And since government is always the expression of the dominant class, eventually government itself, the need for it will kind of wither away, or at least the need for rule, because there won't be any classes anymore. No need for anybody to rule anybody else. And once that happens, Marx called that the end of the prehistory of mankind. And the real history could begin, a history in which everybody would be able to fulfill their own, uh, fulfill themselves, fulfill their own capacities. And they'd be naturally inclined to make their contributions uh, to society, from each according to his ability. And eventually, uh, that's, that would be the basis for distribution, not on, not on the basis of contribution, but eventually it would be from each according to his ability, according to his ability and to each according to his need. And that would be the socialist era, the beginning of the true history of humanity. And what you might be noticing is that that sounds kind of utopian. Marx was reluctant to talk about this side of his own views, but even uh, in the very book where he is renouncing uh, the whole idea of um, the whole idea of, 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 the, of, of German romanticism and uh, of utopianism, in those very sources there are hints about his own utopianism concerning the era of the whole man. Any questions? Comments? Okay, next time you'll hear from Friedrich Hayek, who has a fairly material critique of the whole socialist organization. <laughs>